one of the things with this whole idea of cover crops is what is your goal? What are you trying to do with the cover crop? That is critically important to how you're going to manage them. This is North Dakota. This is water hemp. There's a reason why they call it water hemp on that side. That's our corn before the snow came. So is it any big surprise that the corn's still there? Okay. We've got a lot of tracks, and even in the no-till, the tracks weren't always enough. Okay. We've started to learn about water. Now, normally I'm in a dry situation, but we've started to learn about water. <laughs> so that's one of those fun places where uh, the corn residue blew in and covered that little trench. Uh, and I knew what that trench used to be, how deep it used to be. Well, the clearance on that ATV is over 12 inches to the foot feet. So she's buried pretty good. Uh, the other side there with the green, that is my kosha. That is my job security and always will be. Um, that monster goes anywhere and it seems to drink herbicides in general. This is something I saw this year too. It was pretty easy to count plant population. Don't really want to do that now, do you? The depth was good. Depth was really good. But, uh, <laughs> the emergence, yeah, was a little questionable. Those are my goals in North Dakota. Your goals are going to be a little bit different. I think the water management probably kicks in. Uh, wind erosion is definitely one for us. Water erosion, the salinity I talked about. And it's nice to have a little bit of diversity with your cover crops, but I'm not all king on hundreds of species or 10, 20, 30 species of cover crops. I think three or four or five can do a lot of good. Again, goes back to that idea of moron. This is salinity, just so you know. Let's go back one. Okay, he told me to stand in the front when it doesn't work. Aha! That's salinity, that is not snow. That's the salts that we're talking about on the surface of the soil. That will kill plants. This is what it looks like from the drone. Everything is white is dead soybean. Everything is yellow is very sick soybean. Everything is green is meh soybean. That's a quarter acre, a quarter section. It's a little distorted with the view of the angle. Almost half of that is zero yield. Yeah, why would you do that, right? So the guys look at me, what is going on? Why would you do that? Okay, well, it doesn't look like that when you're planting it. It tends to do that, and soybeans one of the weakest crops. All right, so if you learn nothing else from my talk, I hope you take to part the fact that I start with herbicides first. I start with the herbicides that I need to manage the weeds in those fields. I don't back off. I don't leave space for cover crops. I fit the cover crops into those herbicides. Because weeds are a different animal. If you miss an insect this year, it may or may not be a bad problem next year, right? If you miss a disease this year, it may or may not be a bad problem next year. However, if you miss a weed, how many years can that be a bad problem? Decades. Yeah? So that's one of these issues. Especially when you're talking about the pigweed species, like things like... Water hemp, and I hear Palmer amaranth, pretty nasty. I'm going to find out in the next couple of years. Okay, kochia we know is a bad thing, and those things seed about 100 to 200,000 per seeds per plant. You miss them that year, you've got more than enough to seed acres down with solid issues. So what I recommend to you is do not back off of your herbicides to leave room for your favorite cover crop. I don't think that's wise. Now you can go to sleep and not worry about the rest of it. Okay. So what I do is I fit the cover crop to the herbicide that we needed to use to manage the weeds. Okay. So what does that mean, boss? Oh. Oh, there we went. Ten slides. And back ten. All right. The next thing I'm going to say with this is we're talking about risk management. When I'm talking about cover crops, it's very different than I'm talking about herbicide carryover for a cash crop. A little bit of injury on a cover crop is probably tolerable. Okay? A little bit of stand loss on a cover crop is probably tolerable. Stand loss and crop injury on your cash crop are probably not tolerable. 
because it's a significant economic impact to you. The majority of herbicides in our territory last for about two to four weeks. Okay, two weeks being the majority of it. A few of the really long residual ones will give us four weeks worth of control. And most of these herbicides that I'm using are degradation by biological processes. You heard about microbial degradation, right? That's how they break down. That is a significant amount of your herbicides. Not all of them, but it is a lot of them. So what does that mean? What does it take to break it down if a microbe's gonna eat it? First of all, the microbe's gotta be there. Secondly, it's gotta be happy, healthy, and in a good environment. You know, we're all in here, it's a little warm, you just got fed, you're gonna fall asleep. It's gonna happen. If it was cold and you were starving, you wouldn't be in very good shape. Okay, so the same thing is true of your microbes. If it's too cold or too dry or too hot or too anything, they're a biological situation. So if they're suffering and starving or not working well, they're not gonna do a good job breaking down your herbicides. So warm, moist soils, good temperature, good pH, things break down really readily. Go to organic matter, things tend to break down a little bit better. Make sense? You've heard this, but it's about keeping the microbe happy to do that. Not every herbicide is broken down that way. Okay, I'm gonna use some North Dakota stuff because that's frankly where I'm from, okay? Uh, North Dakota Weed Guide has rotation restrictions on there for cover crops. In four months or less, you're safe. Well, thank you very much for no help at all. <laughs> right, we started, in, we started in May, June, July, August. Game over. September, it freezes. I don't care anymore. All right, so if you follow those recommendations from that herbicide guide, that is the CYA recommendation. Cover your butt. I'm in a church, I gotta remember that. Um, <laughs> cover your butt on that deal so that you don't screw up. That is the sex ultra safe recommendation, okay? Now, it doesn't give you a whole lot of room for covers. I had to shoot into Jeff and see if it works. Oh, and that's going to go 10 of them now. <laughs> hit it. Yeah, hit it for me. All right, so where am I going to find this information on what her cover crops fit into your herbicide program? I'm not going to go over the herbicides because, frankly, I don't know your weeds. I don't know your soil types. I don't know what you're doing. You're going to have to pick your own herbicides. But I can help you find cover crops that fit into those herbicides. The one on the top, USDA cover crop periodic terrible. Type that directly into Google, you'll find it. That will work. Type in cover crop periodic table, you will find it. That will work. I will show you examples of that, okay? The other one is the Midwest Cover Crops Council, which originated in this area. Ohio was a very big part of that. There's a lot of really, really good information on there for your cover crop utilization. That is another place that you need to go for information. Your local state extension weed guides. I did download the Ohio corn and soybean guide. It's differently laid out than what I'm used to, but there's a lot of good information in there. Specifically, several tables that can help you with herbicide rotation, uh, the weed control, and um, other things like that. Now, if you're gonna look at brassicas, and I shouldn't even say this, good thing I don't work for the extension around here, and you wanna find out about herbicide control of radish and turnip and dwarf Essex rape, you're gonna to wanna to look in North Dakota. Why? Because we grow canola. And canola is a close cousin to those brassicas. So don't be afraid to look in other places. The last one is what plant is related to whom? That's the Andersons, the Johnsons. I don't know, what's the, what's the normal last name around here? Smith, that's the Smith. Who's, who's the Smith? Who married what Smith and what they're related to? Okay, that's the normal name. I hear Overmeyer's a pretty big one in the neighborhood too. Or is that a different spot? Okay, whatever. Smith and Johnson, okay. Smith and Wesson? No, no, that's a different thing. Okay, so here is a picture of the cover crop periodic chart. And on there, it has a lot of information for you. The green are the grasses. Uh, the side to that side over there to your right hand side is the warm seasons. Cool seasons are on the left hand side. Broad leaves in the middle. It talks about whether it's an annual, a biennial, or perennial. 
It talks about upright spreading our posture, and it also talks about water usage. And from the drive I had yesterday, you're going to want to see the one with the three rain drops or more, right? High water usage. So that's where you start. If your goal is to use water, you want to pick something that's going to use water, right? You're not going to want to use a lentil. It's going to be dead in a few days, okay? Don't worry about that one. Even peas are going to be iffy, okay? This is, so when you go in there and you click on it, are oh, you going to give me a different one, Jeff? Let's try this one, see if I can handle this one. Hey, that one works. And I'm talking a lot about flax today for a couple of reasons. First of all, I want, to, I want you to buy flax from North Dakota because we need the market. Um, <laughs> secondly, it's a very cool plant. It's one of these plants that's kind of in its own little group as far as crops go. Um, and it's very mycorrhizal. We heard about that earlier today. Our buscular mycorrhizal flax is probably one of the best out there. Okay, um, cool season, whatever. But this is what happens when you click on a specific plate on that previous slide. Like flax is on there, you click on flax, it brings you to a quick fact sheet about what are the traits for flax. It'll do the same thing for chickpeas, all this kind of stuff. So it gives you an idea of what's going on. Anybody heard of phacelia? Five people, okay. So the rest of you are gonna need to click on that plate, see what the heck it is, okay? So those are, that's one way to get some quick information without having to read 700 pages in a nerd article, okay? I like nerd articles, but man, sometimes. Now, here's the Midwest Cover Crop Council page. I do believe it's under construction. There is a North Dakota one and it's not up yet. I'm disappointed in that. Um, in here, you pick your state and here you can pick Hardin County. It comes right up. You go in there and you actually pick your goals that's part of it. Do you want a water usage? Do you want a soil builder? Do you want erosion fighter? Do you want a weed fighter? This goes back to why do you want the cover crop? You need to know why you want it. You need to know what your goals are. This goes back to the yo-yo. Where are you going with this? What are you trying to learn? What are you trying to do? And then it helps pick which cover crops fit those systems. Okay? Makes sense. There you go, there's your weed guide. That thing's expensive. Anyway, it's worth every penny. It will actually have most of the information you need in there. There can be errors. They have recipes in there too? I don't know. He says they have recipes in there as well. So that can be helpful. That can be very helpful. Um, you might need to connect the dots a little bit and I'm gonna go through a little bit of what I mean there. Just remember, the herbicide label is the law. That is federal law. If you go against that, you're breaking a federal law. If you get caught, it's not going to be fun. You may also be breaking a state law at the same time. Keep that in mind, okay? And basically, if you're getting caught, they're going to make an example of you, okay? Now, there's some ways to fudge a little bit. Okay, here is this, this is a chart that gives the classifications of different crops, different weeds, and different cover crops. If you want to find this, I'm going to plug my state again, NDSU Soil Health page, at the bottom, it has a cover crop chart, species chart. I put it together, there's probably several mistakes on this, okay, don't be surprised. Basically what I'm doing is putting things in the families. You'll see there on the side, it's color-coded. The grasses are green, the legumes are blue, the buckwheat's purple, those types of things. That's the Smiths and the Johnsons and who's related to whom, okay? So this can help you understand how they're related and how they're gonna respond to your chemicals. This has a significant list of things as crops, cover crops, and weeds. If they don't have it and you wanna know what it is, you Google scientific name of broccoli or whatever that you wanna put out there. And then you'll find what family it's in. Wikipedia will even have this, and it'll have what family it's in. And that helps you relate it to the Smiths and the Johnsons and who it is, okay? So here's some of the better information. This is my current North Dakota weed guide. These are the ones that I use. These are tables and charts that are in there. Plant back intervals. How long after you sprayed X herbicide can you come back and plant something else? You sprayed verdict on your field, how long till you can plant something? Can you, how long till you can plant wheat? How long till you can plant something else, okay? That will be in there. 
the herbicide carryover. There's a spot in our weed guide and in several weed guides where it talks about herbicide carryover influences, just like I was talking about. Microbial degradation, water, pH, organic matter, those types of things are in there. I was looking in yours, I just didn't have enough time to find it. I'm betting it's in that guide, okay? And then your crop rotation restrictions, how many months till you can plant another crop? Okay, so those are important. This is what I'm getting at with the canola thing. So with the previous slide, go back here. You would find, if you're looking through this, that canola is a brassica, turnips are a brassica, wild mustard is a brassica. They're all related, they're all smiths, okay? They're cousins, so they're not the same, they're not identical, but they're similar. So you'll find in there that dicamba gives you very, very poor control of mustard. You also find in there that dicamba has a short plant back to canola. So what is the risk to radish? Low, medium, or high? Low, exactly. I didn't say none. There's always a risk, there's always something that goes wrong, and then we are talking about cousins, okay? One of them's prettier than the other, too, that's the way it goes. One of them's got a better job than the other one. Just keep that in mind, it doesn't necessarily always work. So that's how I'm using that. The herbicide efficacy is how good is that herbicide at killing this weed, okay? Hopefully this makes sense. And so you're kind of piecing together several sources of information to make an estimate. This is an estimate of risk, okay? Now where we get into legal issues is the grazing restrictions, okay? That's where you can get into legal issues. If you plant a cover crop with a herbicide on it that it can grow in, that you figured out it's not, it's low risk and it's fine, but if you graze it and it's not allowed on the label, you just broke federal law. This is where it can get sticky. If the cover crop is not gonna be used for anything, food, fiber, fiber less problems. If you're gonna put it in the food system or you're gonna run it through livestock, you might have issues, okay? Here's just an example, one of the common ones we use, Armazon Pro, I'm not telling you to use it. Again, it talks about your weed spectrum, the whole thing. It, what it's made out of is in the weed guide. It has a fairly short residual. It'll tell you that on the label. It doesn't last all that long. Three to four weeks, most of it's gone. Not three to four months, like my weed herbicide guide said. And so then there's a lower risk to grasses because it is labeled in corn, but that's a warm season grass. So a little, you know, that type of issue. Now the atrazine, if you put any atrazine with this, can sting millet. So keep that in mind, there's, there's differences, okay? Legumes are gonna be very high risk. This is an HPPD, this is how it works. It has very, very good effectiveness on broadleaf plants. Legumes are in the broadleaf, they're gonna have some issues. Okay, another one, we're using in corn, Resicor. Now my rates are different. I'm using much lower rates because less rainfall, less degradation, the whole thing. We're not using the rates you guys are using. But in this same situation, we've had good luck with cereal rye the flax, maybe wheat or barley, depending on the year, and definitely no legumes or brassicas. This is all through those connecting the dots with these different sources of information, okay? And every time we do this, we are taking a risk with a cover crop not working. If it doesn't rain for me, those microbes are not happy, they're not breaking down the herbicide, the herbicide is at a much higher rate, and the cover crop that should be okay could get severely injured. Definitely possible. If we get a lot of rain, it might go the other way. You might plant something that this would have told you shouldn't have and it might work. I've seen that too. Then you just kind of play with things. Again, don't put them in the food system, don't harvest them and haul them off. I showed earlier about the iron chlorosis in soybeans. This was our first shot at it. We used dicamba soybeans. We put down a pre before anything came up. The pre is not very good at killing grasses. So I'm not surprised that the barley came right through it. Was the barley a little sick? Yes, it was a little sick. I don't really care, it's a cover crop. Okay, it was there. It was helping the soybeans. These soybeans are fairly green. Then we came over with a full dinger, a yeehaw dicamba baby. That barley is not in good shape anymore. Is it dead? No, 
It's really unhappy. The yield of the barley is going to suck, but it's not dead. Do I care about the yield in this situation? Not at all. I wanted to stunt it. I wanted to get weed control. I didn't care about hurting the barley. The barley needed to grow and take up nitrogen and take up water. It was going to continue to do that. We did hurt its ability to do that. But there it is. Okay? That is off-label. Technically illegal. If you don't harvest the cover crop, it never makes it into the food system. I don't know that that's an issue. Okay? So in this case, we're tolerating significant injury. I'm not talking about forest to cover crops that you need a machete to walk through. I just needed the cover crop to manage a little bit of water, help us with that pH, and help us manage this problem. So it goes back to what you want it to do. Whoop. These are my gateway cover crops. Yours may be different. Cereal rye, radish, turnip, oats, and barley. Cheap, easy to get, easy to seed, pretty tough overall, and you know how to kill them. That's my other caveat for this. Know how to kill your cover crops so that you're not planting weeds. Now, we found out that turnips can overwinter in North Dakota in the right conditions. That's pretty significant. A turnip is a biennial, so the second year she's pretty tough. And we saw turnips the size of basketballs. I'm not joking. They were huge. And ALS chemistry, group two, should have annihilated them, but they were big dogs. And it made them mad, is about all it did. They lived through the harvest, they were in the soybean system, and they were bumping on the header every time. The grower was thrilled about this. They smelled really good, too, when they went through the combine like that. <laughs> good thing they were not non-GMOs, because that would have thrown us out of the market. Okay, So you learn things. You screw up. What I tell people is don't try this stuff on 200 acres. Try it on two or two-tenths of an acre and see where you're at. Okay. Cereal rye is one of my favorite ones, by far, bar none. I'm using it to use excess water and get good weed control. In this picture, folks, where the cereal rye is on that side was a saline area full of kochia. And what we did was we planted the, the cereal rye because we just decided not to plant soybeans in there because they don't grow anyway. I showed you the picture earlier on. What's the point? We'll plant the cereal rye in there and just deal with it later. I had no idea that it was that good on kosher. This was in 2006 when we did this. It's been a while. Okay? I think I got a close-up of this one. No, I don't. But you can see the line where the kosher is and where the kosher is not. This is on the edge of the field. Actually, the kosher should have been sprayed, but it was in that little bottleneck next to the road. That's why it's narrower than the sprayer. So he turned around and he's going to come back and get it. Well, he never came back and got it. So that herbicide, there was no herbicide applied in this picture. That was all cereal rye. Now, that's pretty awesome. And again, this, this kosher is resistant to three modes of action. That's pretty cool. And it's like six bucks. I'll take that any day. Plus, it gives me months worth of control. So there's reasons to use these cover crops. Those are my benefits. It's doing a lot of cool things. I don't even know that I need to tell you this. For us, it's a very high risk to, to corn. It's a very, very high risk to corn. We plant corn as soon as we can, not when the soil warms up. My season's too short. We're planting in 40-some degree soil temperatures regularly. We're planting too wet, we're planting too cold, but we're planting as early as we can. We don't have two weeks to go out and kill the, the rye because it's still under snow. Okay, that's the truth of it. So for us, it's very high risk to corn. We end up with an injury often. I would not tend to do that. Volunteers can be an issue if you're growing spring wheat the next year. We can have volunteer cereal rye get into that system and it can be an issue. Okay. So you want to think about your termination and timing methods on that. Radishes. This farmer is shy. He's a really good farmer, does a lot of cool stuff. Um, that radish is 29 days old in North Dakota. That was planted after field peas. So earlier this morning, somebody asked me, what are you doing to get cover crops in it? This is a field pea field with cover crops in it, and this is the end of September. It looks gorgeous. We're getting lots of growth. This field, however, I talked about this, I put field peas on our lighter, sandier ground. This field is lighter and sandier. We did not put CRI in this because it's too aggressive and uses too much water. 
We put oats instead, and oats is a frost kill. And it grows up, and it did well. It does well in lighter soils. We put the radish with it for a little bit more diversity. We also had a little bit of flax in here for straw strength to try to catch snow. So I have a reason for every one of these cover crops that I want to put in there. Does that reason always work? No. <laughs> it doesn't always turn out that way. But we have a reason for every one of them we're putting in there, why we're doing it. And that radish grew really, really fast. We wanted better porosity, and we wanted some organic matter into this. One of the reasons the radish was in there. There's the turnip. That's a two-year-old turnip. A pretty good size. Oh, and by the way, everything that's purple was basically out of the ground. So what does your flex header do with that? Yeah, loves that. They may not winter kill. It's good for forage, that kind of thing, but it's pretty easy to use. Very, very small seed. Here's oats. This is on a stripper-headed field where we left the standing residue. Again, I like it on drier ground. It frost kills. I don't have to worry about it in the spring coming back. If it does volunteer, everything I have for wild oats will kill it in spring wheat or rye. Everything, I can, I can kill it all over in many different things because oats is kind of a wimp. So it's a backup plan to get out of it. Okay. Doesn't have great frost tolerance, but it really, really helps with wind erosion. The other thing we've seen with this is that in my geography, that residue helps me maintain moisture in the spring where it's may be an issue. We may be too dry. Barley, super saline tolerant, a little more frost tolerant, uh, higher herbicide tolerance, I think. It takes a lot to kill this barley. Now, to make it mad and hurt the yield is easy. To kill it's another story. And fairly rapid growth. They use this in the sugar beet production for early spring planting. They'll plant sugar beets into March now. As soon as they can get out there, they'll put a little bit of barley with it, try to get the barley up to help protect the beets from wind erosion. Because the barley grows really, really fast, and it tolerates several herbicides. Back to the moron. Moron is not always better. In my general situation, usually three different species will cover most of the challenges that we face and do it really well. This is a mix of 12 species. It's interesting, it's kind of cool, but it was really, really expensive. These are my guidelines for my growers. They may be different for you. Just keep that in mind. You may need to spend a little more. You may need to have a little more cover. You have a lot of water. You might need more plants per acre than we do. So your rates might be a little more, okay? I know how to kill them, know how to get out of them. That purple in there is hairy vetch. It's a fantastic legume. Does a really, really good job of fixing nitrogen. It doesn't do a whole lot in the first part of the summer. It's really, really small. The second part of the summer, it comes on dramatically. Huge, massive plant that grows really rapidly. If that's what you want, great. It also goes to seed readily, and it shatters readily, and it is very, very herbicide tolerant. If you grow it, you put it on the least ground. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> okay, well... It will be there. You will see it next year and probably five years from now, even if you do a really good job controlling it. If you're interested in hairy vetch, I would steer you to try your taste with common vetch first. It's a cousin. It's not quite as closely related. It has less seed longevity, and it's much easier to kill. I get this question all the time, drill versus broadcast. Broadcasting your cash crops is a bad idea. Why? You get terrible stands. What do you expect from your cover crops that are broadcasted? <laughs> Terrible stands. So should you be surprised? Okay, so if you can, drill it. Or plant it or whatever. This is two different tanks on an air drill. Small seeds in one tank, larger seeds in another tank, running down different holes. It works great. Where am I at on time? 30 minutes left? Cool, then we got time for questions. You guys are really quiet. This is the corn. This is what I was talking about earlier this morning when we were putting our, our rye in cereal rye. Cereal rye. Now, I do not use annual rye in my geography. It just doesn't fit me. I'm not saying it can't fit you. It doesn't fit us. Cereal rye broadcast into corn. These are different rates. This is what it looks like mid-season. Well, end of season. That's September-ish. Yeah, my corn looks like that end of September, typically. Um, very skinny, scraggly, stretched out. It's 12 inches long and three leaves. It's been struggling and fighting for sunlight the whole time. 
That's a good thing. I don't want it to steal the sunlight, the water, and the nutrients from my corn. I want it under there starving. I just want it to be alive when the corn comes off so it looks like the picture with the pickup in it. And it covers the soil. And that's typically what happens for us. The reason we're going so early in our system is because rain is something I cannot count on late season. I get reliable rain in June and early July. I do not get reliable rain in late July and August. It may rain, it may not. It may take six weeks to get a rain. So broadcasting a cover crop with six weeks to a rain, good luck. And if it rains six weeks later and it's the middle of September and tomorrow's the first frost state, I got no growth. That's happened to us several times. So we're broadcasting earlier to plan for a rain so we get germination. Okay, now where I get really, really good corn and once in a while we hit 200 bushel, it might kill my rye. It might choke it out. Whoop-de-doo. I didn't really need it there anyway because what I'm eating this rye for is mostly weed control. So I want it to be competitive with water hemp because once the corn gets up to 36 inches tall, folks, I got nothing left for water hemp control and herbicides. We're done. Game over. And if you have a drown out spot or you have a spot that dies in there, that's called a water hemp preserve. <laughs> I showed you the picture early on. It was growing in standing water. Corn doesn't do that. That's like, that's the best way to proliferate water hemp is to have a dead spot in the middle of a cornfield. You can't see it, I can't see it, don't see it till the combine shows up. The drone doesn't even pick it up, okay? The cereal rye will compete with it. I didn't say it'll kill it, but it'll compete with it. So instead of that water hemp having 200,000 seeds, it might have 200 seeds, that is a, that I call a win. So everybody asks me, how do you do this in soybeans? The answer is, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. So, soybean, way too dense a canopy for us. Unless they're 30 inch rows, our 30 inch rows might never close. Literally. So, there's too dense a canopy, there's no sunlight underneath of there. This was broadcast at the left hand side with yellow leaf. Yellow leaf, right before leaf drop, this was broadcast in, okay? And then the leaves fell down and it stayed moist and humid that fall. And we had good green growth underneath. Some cereal rye and some camelina. What is camelina? Anybody know? It's a cover crop, but what is it? What family? Not same as flax. It is a brassica. It is the same as the mustard species. It's a winter annual mustard. It's a winter mustard that'll live through North Dakota winters. I'm not necessarily recommending it to you. I'm just saying that's what we use. The idea here was to have a broad leaf over winter so we could plant corn into it. That was the idea. And it did work. It goes to seed really, really early in the spring, kind of like Field Pennycrest does. So this worked this time. If you ask me how often this works, my experience has been one in nine years. We got some practicing to do. Get our tricks down on this one. Okay, doesn't mean to quit or give up. Just have realistic expectations. Do we use a skip row type of seeding? Have not. We'll do a lot of testing this year. Again, two acres here and two acres there, several farms. We're going to do 60-inch corn. We're going to do 44-inch corn. We're going to try several different herbicides and cover crop in mixtures. I had a, we had some prevented plant last year that I did a cover crop herbicide interaction plot on. I need to do that again because I learned a lot, and I was very surprised by those results. I might talk about them a little bit. So here's my notes for cover crops. Again, they're not rainbows and puppies. They're not going to save the world. They might help you clean up your water. They might help you reduce your erosion. But you've got to pick the right tool for the job. Do you use your snap ring pliers every day? But by goodness, when you need it, you need it. It is the right tool for a specific job. And you need to have a snap ring pliers in the toolbox. But you don't use it every day. Okay, so keep that in mind with this. Cover crops are tools. Pick the right tool for the right job. When you need that tool, use it. When it doesn't fit, leave it in the toolbox. Don't just throw it out there because it sounds like a good thing and rainbows and puppies are going to run through your fields. Okay. Pay, pay attention. Look around. And then there is a limit to your resources. You only have so much water, so many nutrients, and so much sunlight. Yeah, let's go on. Questions. And if you hadn't heard before, 
I'm plugging the soil sense. Again, I don't get anything out of this, but I think this is a really good podcast. Go for it. Any experience with safflower? Yes, wear chaps or shaps or whatever they're called. Um, safflower is basically a thistle. Um, it is grown as an oil seed crop in Western North Dakota, and I do have some experience. I did work in Western North Dakota a little bit. Um, really likes dry conditions, very, very dry conditions. Does not do well in wet conditions. It tends to get white mold, phytophthora, rhizoctonia, several diseases, and does not do well. Uh, fairly easy to kill, so very herbicide sensitive is what I would say. Um, and it does look like Canada thistle. Huh? What about, shading? what about shading? That I can't tell you. I don't know. I don't know. How much cannellina? What? How much seed do you use in your plant? How much cannellina seed per acre? One to two pounds. Again, very, very small seeded. It should be seeded in the fall. Um, and for you guys, you could go fairly late, I would think. You could go towards the end of the year. I don't know what your weather's like, but late in your fall, okay? Yeah, and it should grow throughout the fall fairly low. Um, it's going to be somewhat water tolerant, not specifically like it would probably flood out in certain areas. And it will go to seed very, very rapidly. It's going to be yellow blooming really early, like along the lines of field pennycrest. Do you have that weed around here? Yeah. Okay, so think of that. When it's going to bloom, it's going to be very early, and you're going to want to be ahead of this because it can have four to 600 pounds of seed per acre. And those seeds are very, very tiny. They're in the thousands and thousands of seeds per pound. We're talking about pretty significant weed problem. However, it's fairly sensitive to herbicides, so a lot of things are going to take care of it. And most growth regulators are going to do a pretty good job. Anything that's good on mustard is going to kill it. What's that? Grubs in the purple top, turnips. No, but I'm not as wet as you guys are typically. And slugs are also not as big an issue for us. We have had slugs once in a while in just isolated spots. Um, that's been the main thing that I've seen. I do see higher incidence of cutworms in cover crop residue. They like residue, they're gonna be there, scout for them, use your integrated pest management, manage them. That's what I can say. It's, you're going to trade one problem for another. And I'll, I'll trade an insect problem for a water problem most times. Most times. This side of the room is sleeping. So the seeding rate with corn and cereal rye. So I tend to start at right around 30 pounds on the low end. I go to a bushel on most cereals. After that, it's pretty heavy for us. But I'm in a different moisture regime in a different situation. On our variable rate seeding, we're starting at 15 pounds on our hilltops where I really don't want to lose a lot of water. I want to save moisture. I need some cover to help reduce the wind. We'll go to 30 to 45 pounds in the middle areas, the slope of the hill. We'll go to 60 to 90 in the low spots. Now that's way more than a bushel, but I'm trying to burn a lot of water. Okay, so it depends on what you're going to do with it. I think a starting rate of that 50 to 60 pounds and then going a little bit less and a little bit more will help you f refine what may wor work for you. I think my impression, cereal rye is one of those things that's very aggressive and I have to be a little bit cautious with it. If you're trying to use a ton of water, okay, fine, go up to 80, 90 pounds. You get to a 100 pound range, it's hard to get enough of it wet with a herbicide to kill it. It gets really, really thick. Okay, so be careful when you get really, really thick you could have issues. Now, you, maybe it's just a respray, and that's not the end of the world, but understand there are certain times when cereal ride doesn't kill very well. It's just, it, it's just something about its anatomy. It doesn't, and I don't know exactly what it is, but I've seen it several times. And if you do anything to it beforehand, so guys are running with a vertical tillage before they're gonna go, don't do that. You won't kill any of it. You'll make it all mad. It won't take in the herbicide. It's too cold. It's, not, it's gonna go blow right through it. If you're gonna use mechanical, Termination, use mechanical termination, make sure it works. I'd be more interested in the crimper than anything else. Another cool thing for us that's gonna be an issue this year is cereal rye, you can plant it in May, and it will stay small all year. We're gonna be doing that on some of those cornfields I showed you. They're gonna be harvested in June. There's gonna be cornfields planted as cereal rye as a cover crop to help manage water for next year. We're not gonna get a cash crop on that. 
Uh, it's not going to get much bigger than this for this summer. So cutting the tops off, I'm not too worried about it. If you just cut the top off a of cereal rye, it'll come back. I will say that. Relay and companion cropping. I did talk about the flax and peas this morning. Those were both harvested. Um, I talked about how we used barley for iron chlorosis. That I've done. I know that people have done peas and canola a little bit, oats and canola a little bit, oats, peas, and canola a little bit. I, I'm not your expert on that. We've tried a few things. We've played with a few things. I think there's room for that. I start with weed control first. So if I can't find a companion crop that fits with my weed control, I'm not going there because there's too many years of problems to deal with if you screw up your weed control. This whole side of the room has said nothing. There's got to be one question over there. I like this part, folks. Let's keep this going. Don't make me get off stage right away. Planting oats in the fall for wheat. Okay, so most of the wheat I plant is spring wheat because the winter wheat doesn't do well. The one cereal that makes it through our winters is cereal rye. Triticale is a breed between spring wheat or winter wheat and cereal rye, and it may make it through the winter. And most of my um, winter wheat looks like a mangy coyote. There's a patch here and a patch there and a patch here and a patch there. That's what it looks like. So we don't do a whole lot of winter wheat. Um, however, with that said, you don't have to go exclusively oats or cereal rye or wheat or winter wheat. You can mix them for those types of things. Like if you want a little bit of cover in the spring, but you need more moisture usage in the fall, going half and half with oats and cereal rye will give you a lot more water usage and half of it will die out and then half of it will be there next year. There are no rules to this. You can do whatever makes sense to you. So that's a possibility. I don't know if that answered your question. I really don't have winter wheat, so I did years ago, and 40 bushel was all we could get, and spring wheat can go 80, so I'll quit growing it. How suitable is camelina beef if you do a camelina rye mix broadcast at late summer planting this next spring? Camelina plus cereal rye fall broadcast, or late summer broadcast, and then plant soybeans next year. Yes, I think those two would get along really well. I think they would. Better than rape? Better than rape? Yes, I think so. I think so. Um, we did have a producer that relay cropped, this goes back to your question, camelina and soybean. He planted camelina in the fall, and then he planted soybean, in, moved over 30 inch rows, and then cut the camelina off after the soybeans were up. They were about this big. Harvested the camelina, and then harvested the soybeans later on. Uh, Camelina yielded about 400 pounds an acre, but he has no market for it. So that's kind of where that went. Uh, he did hurt some of the yield in places. It didn't necessarily cut off really well. He had some volunteers. He's going to have a weed problem. It hurt the soybeans a little bit because he cut them. Not so much that the Camelina was competing with it, but the cutter bar hurt him. That was what we saw there. Yeah, you'd be fine. No-till burn down with that. You'd be fine. Do it early enough. Cameline's going to be really early. Well, if that's all you got, win the back. Have I looked into why certain weeds are in certain places and used that to help establish a cover crop mix? Absolutely. The weeds will tell you a lot of this story. So a lot of things that happen with my no-till guys, when they first move into no-till, the first few transition years, dandelions kick up and kick our tail. They really get bad. Mare's tail is another one that kicks up and gets to us, okay? So that is a late season seeding of that plant. It's getting germinated in the fall. It's got an opportunity. There's a window there for that to get started. And next year, it's already moving into its second year. They're really hard to kill, both the mare's tail and the dandelions, but especially dandelions. You get dandelions that are this big, man, oof, they're tough, okay? And that happens with a lot of people transitioning into no-till. It's a very common thing. So in that system, what I want to do is I want to have a competing crop of a cover crop that is fall thick 
and heavy and competing at the same time that those dandelions or mare's tail would be there. So that's how I'm picking the cereal rye for a lot of these situations. So yes, you use those to clue you in on to when you have gaps in your system. That weed is responding to a gap in your system. I don't know that it tells me anything about fertility or biology or it just tells me about sunlight, nutrients, and water left over and the weed wants them. Like that's how Mother Nature works, right? Drive down the highway, look at the median. Something's growing in there. Walk, walk the sidewalk to the next one. You'll find something growing there.